Okay, welcome everyone to the morning session. Uh, we'll have a couple of talks on PSP. The first talk will be David Smart, who's talking about the research advances. Thanks, Mohit, and thanks to the organizers for a chance to give this survey um, that uh, will outline a lot of recent progress uh, on the ordinary TSP and a closely related problem, the STS TSP path. Um, so probably everyone knows what the traveling salesman problem was, but uh, let me define it for you anyway. Uh, get the notation down. Um, think about given a weighted complete graph G um, with cost C on the edges, um, and we want to find a minimum weight, minimum total cost Hamiltonian circuit, a cycle that visits every node in the graph exactly once and returns to the origin. This is a figure from the celebrated paper of uh, Danzig, Fulkerson, Johnson in 54, which solved the then 48 capital problem um, for the US. Actually, it's 49 because they also included DC. Uh, so we're going to be focusing on the metric case. So that is that I'm going to assume, and there are two equivalent versions to think about, that the triangle holds on the cost, so that um, the shortest uh, route between any pair of points is the direct one. Or it's equivalent to think about where I'm allowing multiple visits to each, each vertex. Those are equivalent versions of the problem. It's empty hard in Dick's original paper. Um, and Christofides, uh, in 1976 gave a three halves approximation algorithm by a row approximation algorithm going, going to mean an algorithm that delivers a feasible solution, runs in polynomial time, and produces a solution of cost within a factor of row of optimal. Okay? And that's where we still are. You know, it's a few years later. Um, and, and stated in this uh, general way, nothing better is known. But I think you could say I'm done. I'm just there. That's the recent progress. But but there there are a few things still to talk about. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'll also be talking about this what seems to be closely related problem, but but in many ways is different and has given us uh, room for improvement. Um, the ST path TSP and it's essentially the same thing, except I fix both a starting point S and an endpoint T, and now I want the minimum cost Hamiltonian path that exactly goes between those, that pair of endpoints. Um, it's all clearly also NP-hard. And uh, Hochevein uh, showed, uh, still not quite as long ago, but still pretty long time ago, um, that the, the natural extension of Christofides algorithm uh, is a 5 thirds approximation algorithm, and also that that bound is tight. So this has been exciting times. And in really, from my sense of sort of how the history of science worked, the real kickoff and the energizing event was a, was a really beautiful result of Asapur Gurman's Madri, Yobas Garan, and Saberi, uh, which uh, pioneered what they called the thin tree approach. Uh, and not in for either of the problems I already mentioned, but for the so-called asymmetric case. So I'm still going to assume that there's triangle inequality, but that uh, um, the distance from I to J can be different from the distance from J to I. Um, and uh, the, the, the key in, a, or the, in some sense were two primary pieces of, uh, of innovation in addition to the, the, the framework of thin trees was that as opposed to um, the approaches that came out of the original algorithms or even Christofides, Rather than first trying to start with a deterministic selection of a tree and augmenting that to something that could be um, traversed well as being Eulerian, um, the new element here was to use randomization, that, that to use a randomly selected tree. And then there was a key role uh, of the maximum entropy distribution as being the mechanism by which that random selection was done. Oh. And in some ways, those two elements were then carried over in uh, equally exciting work by Ovis Garan, Saberi, and Singh, not for the full generality of the symmetric case, but for a special class of metrics. So if I give you an undirected graph, uh, and it's unweighted, and I define the distance between a pair of nodes to be the number of edges in the shortest path between that 
that pair of nodes, that gives rise, rise to a metric, and it's clearly a, a specialized one. And that's what I'll call the unit weight graphical metric. Um, and, and they shaved off literally an epsilon, or even less than that, um, <laughs> uh, uh, off of the three halves. Um, again, combining those two elements uh, in, a, in a fundamental way. Mumke and Svensson, in a, using a very different approach in a way that sort of less explicitly relies on in a formal relaxation as is the sort of theme of this workshop, um, then actually gave a, a, a very elegant, very beautiful, and in some ways more substantial improvement um, just shortly thereafter. And this led to a sequence of results. For the ST path, and this is where I'll sort of spend most of the time today, uh, it's actually turned out to be relatively easy to provide a randomized variant of Christophides and not even use the maximum entropy piece to, uh, for the arbitrary metric, now not just the unit weight graphical metric, um, to, to get improvements on, on the basic case. And, and yet there also are improvements on the, the unit weight case and there are for a series of analyses as well. So, so that was where things stood hmm, three, four years ago. Um, and then the, the things continued to accelerate. Um, that on the, in the thin tree world, uh, that uh, Marcus Spielman and Srivastava's uh, fundamental groundbreaking work was shown how to be used as a tool by Anari and Govescaran and gave improvements um, in, for the asymmetric TSP. Uh, now, interestingly enough, this was, in some sense, an existential re result. It proved improvements in the integrality gap, the ratio between the optimal integer solution and an optimal fractional solution, but it actually didn't provide an algorithm to produce the tour. Um, work continued unabated on, on the unit weight graphical metric in the symmetric case, and a lot of the work there was, was on restricted classes of graphs and for which there were improvements. And on the ST path, there were a series of refinements of Vegan, Gottschalk and Vegan, um, and Chebe and Van Sowlen. Um, and at the point that the uh, organizers asked me to give this talk, that was the way things stood. Um, and they, they had proved a three halves plus one over 34 approximation algorithm. So, so like, you know, 3% above what, uh, uh, in some sense, we might be hoping for. But that's still, we're still not done. Um, and uh, um, over, just over the summer, there have been two stunning advances. Um, the first you get to hear t in the next hour. So I'm not going to say anything about that. I'll tell you, we'll talk about the first constant approximation algorithm for the asymmetric TSP. Um, and uh, um, the Traub and Vegan showed how you can build upon the relaxations that uh, have been used up till now for the ST path and adding both uh, sort of a kind of recursive dynamic programming framework to show that you can achieve arbitrarily close to three halves. And if all goes well, I'll get to give you a flavor of how that works as well. Okay? So, so tremendous amount of progress and tremendous amount of work in a, in a very short span of time. And really, in some sense, the higher level question is how does randomization can help us to beat what a straightforward Christophides algorithm is? And I'll go through things in detail, but uh, um, at, at the highest level on the left, the deterministic standard Christophides says we start with a minimum spanning tree for our input. We try to build connectivity. <coughs> we augment that tree into a low cost Eulerian circuit if we're looking for a tour or a path um, there, and then we transform it into a Hamiltonian circuit. In contrast to that, how can we instead, rather than choosing a minimum spanning tree, cho choose a carefully selected from a, an appropriate random, dis random distribution, uh, probability distribution, select a random tree? And this was the, the approach pioneered first by Asad Puridal and then in the asymmetric case, and then um, that uh, Oves Gara and Savary and Singh conjectured that for the standard Christophides alg algorithm, that this indeed led to a, an improvement. They proved a slight modification of, the, of, of that, um, but more or less exactly that um, for the unit graphical, unit weight graphical metric, and, and then uh, this is exactly the framework that we used. So probably, I know this is sort of this, this mixture of, of, of continuous and discrete, so I'm going to try to make this completely talk completely self-contained. So although probably 99% of you know what Christophides is, I will start and just walk you through from, 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 from the ground up. 
OK, so Christofidis algorithm. Imagine that I'm given a collection of points. And uh, for, for that input, uh, the physical distance on the screen is the cost of connecting that pair of points. Um, we start by computing a minimum spanning tree. There you have it. Um, and then we take advantage of the oldest theorem that wasn't quite proved uh, at, by Euler, uh, that every graph has an Eulerian circuit um, if and only if uh, the graph is connected and every vertex has an even degree, an Eulerian circuit being a traversal of the graph which visits every edge exactly once and returns to where it starts. Um, and uh, Christofides identifies those vertices in our graph which have the wrong parity of degree. The, in this case, it's the odd degree vertices. Those are indicated in red. Um, and then, um, perhaps in a somewhat non-standard language for, for, for many of you, um, we find a minimum cost T join J. So T in this uh, discussion is actually a variable. It exactly corresponds to the set of wrong parity of degree nodes. And it's simply a set of edges with the property that um, the degree of that set of edges is odd for each node in T. And those are exactly the ones of odd degree. So that's, a, for example, a T join for if those red nodes are the, are the set T, or that's a T join, or much more simply, that's a t-join. And when you have the metric case, it is, it is always true that the minimum, a, a minimum cost uh, t-join is, is a matching on the set of nodes. Okay. So, so we add that t-join in. Um, this now makes, because we've corrected the parity of all of the ones that were wrong before, and it's still connected. This now gives us an Eulerian graph. We have an Eulerian tour. Um, and then we can shortcut it to get a cycle. That's Christofides. OK. Let's switch to the ST path. So let me just lift from what we you know, sort of do standardly for tours. Um, in the, and it's going to be the exact same algorithm. OK, so now that's the same input, but now I'm going to have to tell you what's S and what's T. Let's say that those are my S and T. Um, and of course, what I now want is an Eulerian graph with respect to paths. So now I require that S and T have odd degree, and all the others have even degree. Um, so now, if I highlight what are the wrong parity of degrees um, in, from the minimum spanning tree, it is those four uh, red nodes, that uh, S being even is bad, and um, the others are odd and bad. Uh, and uh, so we find the minimum cost t-join. Um, whoops. Um, we uh, find an Eulerian path, and we shortcut. Okay. So, so, so that's Christofides for ST path. Um, and as I mentioned, that uh, the analysis that Hochevein gave for ST path was, was tight. It's a five thirds approximation algorithm. And this is a unit weight graphical metric instance. So the way to interpret it, this is the graph. And the distance between any pair of nodes is the number of edges in the shortest path between them. Um, the minimum spanning tree is really, in this context, the same thing as computing a span any spanning tree. I have the full flexibility of which spanning tree to choose um, if I in a, and perverse and choose this one, um, then the red nodes are the ones of bad degree. And this could be the matching. And you can see that I'm sort of taking 2 thirds of the uh, total length in that matching and that I actually need to use that. There won't be any shortcutting um, that saves anything. Um, and in contrast, the fact that, of course, I could just go straight from left to right and uh, have a Hamiltonian path of length then. So, so this is tight. And the goal is to do something better. Okay. A bit of notation. Uh, if I have a cut with a set of nodes S, um, and I'm going to let delta of S denote the edges in the cut, so the red edges that I've highlighted. Um, if I have a vector on, uh, defined on the edges of that set for X of F, will denote the sum of X over that subset. Okay. So, and I'm going to be using the notions of an incidence vector so that, whoops, uh, if I uh, um, use chi sub f to indicate those, uh, the 0, 1 vector, which is 1 on f and 0 otherwise. OK? Great. So one of the nice things about this, this, how this area has evolved from my perspective, sort of from an aesthetic point of view, is it's, it's really been a place where the, there's been a tremendous interplay between our understanding of polyhedral characterizations of the underlying combinatorial or the related underlying combinatorial optimization problems and the design of algorithms. Um, and so, of course, 
polyhedral combinatorics started with the classic work of Edmonds, characterizing the minimum spanning tree polytope. Uh, so in, in effect, what we're doing is we're viewing um, the minimum spanning tree as a linear programming problem simply by taking the convex hull of incidence vectors of every, every spanning tree in the input. Um, and the, the fundamental question of polyhedral combinatorics is if I give you a geometrically defined uh, object in this way, how do I write an uh, inequality version of the linear program that exactly characterizes that? Um, and Edmund's answer in this way was that if I let script P be the set of partitions of a given vertex and I take a particular partition S, then, and I now generalize my delta notation to be the set of edges that have endpoints in different parts, not just across two parts that I had before, um, then here are the constraints that we need. Well, every spanning tree has n minus one edges, so that constraint exactly tells us that. And furthermore, if I think about any k-way partition uh, into different parts, then the spanning tree has to connect amongst those parts, so, so we're going to need at least k minus one edges that uh, are in the cuts defined, and they're between zero and one. And Edmund says this is exactly the, uh, the same thing as the convex. So how is this useful in terms of our analysis? Um, that uh, um, one thing that we can use this for is that if I uh, want to prove that the optimal solution um, to the minimum spanning tree is cheap, all I have to exhibit is a feasible solution to this linear program. Because I know that the optimal solution is achieved at a vertex which corresponds to the minimum spanning tree. So the mere exhibiting of a feasible, potentially fractional solution is sufficient to give an upper bound on the quality of, of the solution that I want. And then, therefore, the name of the game is going to be exactly producing fractional solutions that are good rather than necessarily integer ones. And that's going to give us a lot of flexibility. Okay. So, um, so meanwhile, back to the TSP, uh, that uh, the standard LP uh, relaxation for the TSP is, is as follows. I have an edge, uh, I have a variable associated with each edge, and I have two kinds of constraints. I have constraints that say that for each vertex, uh, I have to have exactly two edges incident to it, and for each cut, I have to have at least two edges that go across that cut. Now, if I have a feasible solution that's integer, that's 0, 1, for, for this formulation, then clearly that's a feasible tour. We're going to be considering um, the uh, LP relaxation. So let's let x star, and throughout this talk, x star will always denote the LP optimum. Um, that, uh, oh, that gives us a lower bound. Um, and uh, one thing that's, that's easy to see is that if I take any feasible solution uh, to this linear program, and I rescale it, you know, this, this, any feasible solution here sort of has in total, by degree bounds, fractionally totally n edges. If I rescale it by n minus 1 over n, then it's fractionally, it has about n minus 1 edges. It's easy to argue that this is actually a feasible solution in the spanning tree polytope. Um, so one thing that we know right off the bat, then, is that if I look at the cost of, uh, um, if I take the, the LP solution, the optimal LP solution that rescale it, then this actually also gives me an upper bound on the cost of the minimum spanning tree exactly by this um, exhibiting a feasible fractional solution principle. So if I'm thinking about trying to analyze uh, Christofidis algorithms from a linear programming perspective, then I had two elements in terms of what we put into the solution. We put in a minimum spanning tree and we put a minimum cost t-joint. So I talked about the polyhedral underlying for the spanning tree. Now I'm going to need the, the exact analog for t-joints. So and this goes to a classic result of Edmonds and Johnson, which says the following, that now if I take a set S and suppose that it has an odd number of the wrong parity of degree nodes contained within it, then given that I need to pair up each of them, and they can pair up evenly, there must be one edge that reaches across that cut. So, so that says that, and now I'll think about deciding which edges are in the T join by a, var a variable Y sub E. This says that across each cut for which there is this odd cardinality intersection with the candidate set, sometimes I'll call them odd sets, um, that there has to be at least one. Okay, and again, this gives an exact characterization of what it means to um, optimize over the integer objects as well that I can uh, optimize over this instead. 
So, and I'll call such a feasible solution a fractional T join in an upper bound step. So, so Woolsey observed that although there are purely combinatorial analyses, you can get this LP-based proof um, simply by saying, well, suppose we start out with our optimal solution to the standard LP relaxation and generate a vector y by dividing each component of that by 2. Okay? Now, I claim that if you think about the fact that for every subset, the original LP solution satisfies that it's at least 2, when I divide it by a half for each subset, let alone just for all of the odd subsets, the amount of weight going across the cut is going to be at least 1 for that rescaled vector. So, so in fact, y, this y star is a fractional t-join. And so that, of course, gives us a way of upper bounding the cost of the optimal integer t-join that we can compute as part of the algorithm. And this, the tour that we computed is shortcutted from the union of the spanning tree and the t-join. The spanning tree is bounded by the original LP. The uh, uh, t-join is bounded by y star, which is half. So that's 3 halves times the LP. So, so this is a purely LP-based proof of the bound of, of Christofides algorithm. Um, and this you know, highlights what is, in some sense, always the driving force in, using, in deriving approximation algorithms based on relaxations is that the so-called integrality gap. You know, how much can we hope to, do, to prove in terms of the performance of an algorithm if we're solely basing the performance based on what the relaxation is? Um, so for, uh, for the TSP, uh, what I've just shown is that the integrality gap is at most 3 halves. Um, and in fact, there are examples that show that it's at least four thirds. And there are conjectures dating back to the 70s. Um, we don't really know who, who really should get credit for the conjecture. It might be Cunningham, it might be Seymour, it might be Pulley Blank, that, they're, that uh, one amongst them um, probably should be at, get credit for the conjecture that it's four thirds. For the path case, and I'll show you this in a minute, that you can get an, an analogous upper bound of, of five thirds, and then we'll make progress on that. Um, that uh, there's an analogous lower bound of 3 halves. So already we see that these problems are different. This is the worst case example for, for the ST path somehow for, for um, sort of combinatorial non-niceties of having those two endpoints means that the LP is, is sort of already off to a weak start. Um, so what is the LP? So the LP is very much analogous, um, but, you know, it's, but it's different. Um, the, for, for S and T, we only have degree 1. Everything else has degree 2. You have to be a little careful about cuts. There are two different kinds of cuts. If I only have one of my endpoints in the set S, then, of course, I only need to have at least one edge going across the cut. If I have both of my endpoints in the set or neither, then I'm still going to need to have at least two edges going across the cut. So I end up with constraints like that. OK? So good. Um, one thing to observe is that uh, um, it, this is uh, polynomial time solvable by the Lipsoid method, and there are other ways of doing that as well. Um, and also, that not surprisingly, when one thinks about the, what I already told you about the rescaled version of, of the uh, Tour version, I mean, this a path is a spanning tree that, that, in fact, this is contained within the spanning tree polytope in its entirety without any rescaling. Um, and furthermore, since it's contained within the spanning tree polytope, this means that any feasible solution can be written as a convex combination of its extreme points, which are spanning trees. And so that we means that we can take the optimal solution and re rewrite it as such a convex combination. And in fact, Gritschel-Lovas and Schreiber um, already show how to actually do that effectively in polynomial time. So I'm going to need that as a tool. OK, so good. So, so this is the algorithm that we proposed a few years ago, which I call the best of many Christofides. Um, and it works as follows. Suppose I start by computing the optimal solution to that LP relaxation, call that x star, um, and now rewrite that x star as a convex combination of spanning trees t1 through tk. And now, for each of those spanning trees, run the ordinary Christofides algorithm. So just you know, take that tree, for, that has a set of wrong parity of degree, um, find the minimum t-join ji for that ith one, augment, and shortcut it to a Hamiltonian path. And then you now have a collection of uh, a polynomial. Because of, of uh, standard things in polyhedral combinatorics, we know that there are actually a polynomial number of, of such trees that we can write it as. And so we can just take the best of that polynomial number of paths and output that. Okay, So that's best of Christofides. Okay? I mean, 
I've been blasting ahead, but please, please do interrupt with questions. OK. But rather than analyze that, we're going to instead analyze a randomized version. So now, do the same thing. Compute an optimal solution to the held carp relaxation, to the LP relaxation. Um, and now rewrite it as a convex combination of spanning trees, um, as follows. But now view that convex combination as a probability distribution over that subset of spanning trees and just blithely sample according to that distribution and just choose one sample. So choose ti with probability lambda i and now extend that um, spanning tree by the standard Christopides. Okay, so that's the algorithm I want to analyze. One obvious thing is the relationship between the two um, algorithms, the, the enumerative one and the random one. If I can show that the expected cost of the random one um, is bounded by rho times the optimal value, that, and now, of course, that expectation is computed just solely over the random choice of, of, of spanning trees. Then, of course, the algorithm that tries each and every one of them has to do no worse than, than taking the best of that, that average. Okay? So, so that's, this randomized analysis is a mechanism for proving a bound on the deterministic algorithm. One easy next step. I mean, if, I, if you think about what the convex combination means and think about what's the probability that I, the random tree contains a particular edge, well, it's just the weight that it occurs in total over that distribution of, the, of, of, uh, of, of trees. It exactly sums, because it's a convex combination, to uh, the, the original LP value. So that says the probability of an edge being in there is exactly the original LP value that we started with. And so the expected cost of the spanning tree that we produce by linearity of expectation is, of course, exactly the LP value that we, uh, objective function value that, that we started with. So if you think about what we just did of replacing a minimum uh, spanning tree by this random selection, we haven't lost, well, we, have, we, we might have lost something. We might have gotten a more expensive object, but our ability to bound that tree by the optimal value is still intact because it's bounded above by the, the LP value. Okay, so, so, so all we have to do is now wonder about, now we have a random tree which gives rise to a random set of wrong parity of degree nodes, and therefore we're going to compute an optimal t-join for that random set, and we want to be able to bound the expectation of the minimum cost that we're going to need. Okay, and that's what we're going to need to focus on. So, so if I'm going to prove, let's just even start where, as a baseline with the five thirds. Um, if I'm going to prove a, a, a two thirds bound on the cost of the t join, again I'm going to do it by exhibiting a fractional solution to the to the LP relaxation, which must have expected value that's no more than two thirds times the LP value. That's the goal here. Okay. Um, and just again, notation, this has been our optimal LP value, and then of course this is going to be the incidence vector of the spanning tree that we selected at random. Now, sort of if you lift back sort of analyses that you know and love, um, one thing that you can think about is, so we just saw the Christofides algorithm, now we can be interpreted as using half of the <coughs> LP solution as the fractional t-join. And we also know, you know, thinking back to the ordinary TSP case and the double tree algorithm, that it's also standard to think about using the spanning tree itself as a fractional t-join. So one thing that we now can do is um, think about taking a fraction of the two vectors where the total weight on the two vectors sums to two thirds, if I can do that, then I'll get exactly what I want. That, uh, so that's the goal. Okay, so, so, so that's what we want to do. Um, everybody with me? Just cause not a good point to lose you. Um, now, of course, individually, life is just bad. If I want um, that just beta times x star to be a fractional t-join. Um, if you think about what's happening before, whereas in the Tour case, we could divide by 2 and have that 2 come down to be at least 1. For, for the path case, we have lots of these cuts that are only going to be at least 1. If I rescale by any amount, all of a sudden I'm going to start violating those. So, so that's, that's not looking promising. Um, now, similarly, what about the incidence vector to the tree? I mean, one thing one knows about tree is, of course, every cut there's at least one edge going across. But 
again, I don't have any room to spare, it seems. I mean, I'd like to have maybe two edges going across, and that's exactly where we're going. So, so because of course I'm going to need, um, for my uh, fractional t-join solution, I'm going to need that at least one for each odd cut. So here's the lemma that drives everything. It's trivial. It has even a trivial proof. Yeah, maybe I'm going to do it. Um, just to prove to you that it's trivial. Um, that, but here's the, here's the result. I take any spanning tree. I take any cut that separates S and T. Those are the ones where I have the constraint that there's only at least one in my LP solution going across. Um, and it's an odd cut. So it means that I have, I have an odd number of wrong parity of degree nodes um, within that. Claim there are at least two edges in the spanning tree that go across the cut. Magic. OK? Not magic. Easy counting argument. OK, let's do the counting. So like right here, this is, this is an example that this is a, a wrong parity of degree. That's wrong parity of degree. That's wrong parity of degree. Okay. And lo and behold, there are two edges that go across the cut. OK, so what I'm really going to do is I'm going to show there are an even number of edges that go across the cut. And since it's a spanning tree, there has to be at least one. And if it's one and it's, least, it's even, it has to be at least two. OK. So here's the counting argument. Count the total degree of nodes in U. So what does that do? That contribute for every edge that goes across the, the cut, we count that once. But every edge that's within, within U, we count that twice. So I can rewrite that as the, the, the edges that go across the cut is the sum of the total degree minus two times the number of edges within. I just move that sum over to the other side. But this says that this is the number of edges in the cut. There are, so if I show you that there are an even number of odd degree nodes in U, then this is going to be even. So let me do that. That's easy. Um, well, this was an odd cut. So there are an odd number of wrong degree nodes. So either S is even, and then the number of odd nodes are is, is even, or S is odd, it's not wrong, and then we balance out the other way. So I'm done. So, and this is everything. This is, this is what's going to drive at least 50% of the work to go. Good. Um, OK, so, so we know if I look at the spanning tree that there are at least two edges that go across the, the, the cut for the T incidence vector. Um, but uh, only one for, for the LP. On the other hand, for the <laughs> non-separating cuts, then we know that the LP gives us two, but the, the L, uh, but, but the incidence vector of the tree only gives us one. So it's pretty easy to figure out what I'm going to do. I'm going to weight each with one third. So we're going to take that alpha and the beta both equal to one third. And when we add them up, then we're going to get at least one in terms of fractional weight going across. Because remember, all I needed to do is to exhibit a fractional solution that was feasible, that had good cost, and, and, and I'm in business. OK, so, so, so that's my feasible fractional solution to my t-joint polytope. And uh, away I go. And, uh, and the analysis of the cost is just as straightforward, that I, I need to analyze the cost of y, which is really just the expected cost of the inc alpha times the incidence vector plus beta times the LP. And we know separately that uh, we, we can just add up then the, the results as, as follows. OK? So, so we can, in general, and this is, you know, I took alpha plus beta so as to guarantee feasibility. Um, in one third, one third. But in general, when, no matter what I get, if I you know, take alpha times this and beta times that, I'm going to end up with a one plus alpha plus beta approximation algorithm. Okay. Next step. And actually, you could have, although I analyzed this other problem, you actually could use it more or less the same um, original algorithm to get an LP-based proof. Next idea. Okay, so that worked to get us five thirds. So now I'm going to take alpha and beta and I'm going to just perturb it, them slightly. I'm going to decrease the weight on alpha, on the, the tree part, by 2 epsilon, and increase the weight on, uh, on the LP solution by epsilon. OK, so what happens there? Well, 
if I look at what happens for the non-separating cuts, we're decreasing this by 2 epsilon, and we're increasing that by epsilon, but it gets multiplied by 2. So the net perturbation is a wash. And so we're still satisfying those constraints. On the other hand, for the ST cuts, life could be bad. You know, this goes down by um, 2 epsilon. This goes up by epsilon. The net re result is that we could go down by 3 epsilon over what we're satisfied. And all of a sudden, no longer achieving at least 1, we're achieving at least 1 minus 3 epsilon. There's sort of a deficiency that, that's uh, creeping in in terms of what, how much weight I'm putting across some of the cuts that I need to satisfy. And so, 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 but, but, it's, but it's a small deficiency. Right? If I only think about this as small perturbation, it's only missing by a little bit. Okay. And what happens to the cost? Well, that's good, right? Because the cost, I mean, this goes down by 2 epsilon, this goes up by epsilon, that, that the overall net effect on the cost is going to be to go down. So, so if I can make this work, and it's going to go down proportional to epsilon. So if I had any slack in my ST cuts to start with, you know, if it wasn't exactly one, that, 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 well, that perturbation would be fine. So with that in mind, I'll define a tau narrow cut as to sort of give you a sense of how much slack there is in that constraint. So, so for it's a ST cut, just any ST cut, with the property that the total weight that goes at it is less than 1 plus tau. Okay, so those are the ones that are in danger by this perturbation. So one thing you might start worrying about is, well, I might have some cuts that are already at 1, and even just the slightest perturbation is going to violate it. And actually, one can prove in sort of a corollary of that, that previous lemma by a kind of averaging argument, um, that in fact, any cut that um, has LP weight exactly one can't be odd. And the reason is that you're really, what that LP weight is, an is an average weight over spanning trees. And since each spanning tree always has weight of one going across it, if you, if you go a little under, then, then, then you must, I mean, if you, if you get exactly one, you must be hitting it with exactly one every time. Similarly, you can argue, whoops, I didn't want to do that, um, that if you look at how much slack I have, if you, I look at a tau narrow cut, the probability that that is odd is bounded by tau. So the, the previous case is just a special case of what I had said before. And that has, a, again, three line proof, not hard. So what have we got? We've got sort of non-separating cuts and the ST cuts. You know, they're, they're good as I do the, the uh, the SD cuts that sort of are, have some slack in it, they're good if I do this little perturbation and can input things. Um, violation happens with probabilities smaller than something that's order epsilon in terms of uh, there. And when this happens, the cut will have sort of deficiency that's proportional to epsilon. Okay? They're just tiny there. So let's just fantasize that the sets of um, tau narrow cuts were actually disjoint sets. So that if I looked at those edge sets from all the different tau narrow cuts, that they just hit different edges. Well, I claim that what I can do then is take my original alpha plus beta, which has now been perturbed a little bit, and just boost it a little bit by some small amount. And how much amount? Well, just you know the deficiency for any edge that happens to appear in one of those cuts. So if it's in one of those tau narrow cuts, you know, just, just put that deficiency, which was sort of epsilon up, and only do it when it's odd. And now I need to compute the expectation of you know, how much I'm putting in. And there's sort of this probabilistic element that I'm only adding in this cost when it's odd, and that happens rarely. And, uh, and itself not the, sorry. And so first of all, it's clear that this is a fractional t-join. And it's also straight, I mean, essentially the analysis I just gave you says that the expected cost of this little extra boost is no, um, no more than the deficiency times tau times the original LP cost. And notice, this is like O of epsilon. And this is like O of epsilon. So this is like some O of epsilon squared times the LP value. 
And I already argued that the change of the LP cost improved by this perturbation by something that was order epsilon times the LP value. So now it's just a question of balancing the constants, right? That, that you sort of see that, hey, if, that, uh, if, if this all works out, then, then, then we should be able to get some improvements. Um, another language of, of saying this is to um, <coughs> write out this correction vector a little bit more explicitly this way, and, and, and uh, oh, but it's, that's really the same thing. Okay. And so if our fantasy were true, if you work out the balancing, we get some slight improvement on the 5 thirds. Not a huge improvement, like 1.65. And that's all still based on this fantasy, which isn't true. So they're not disjoint. So now I'm going to kind of get to the next key element of, of, from an idea perspective, which is they're not disjoint, but they're highly structured. They form a laminar family. I mean, not even a laminar family, a nested family. That, that, that uh, if I look at the, the set of, 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 of town arrow cuts, then, then, then I have this additional property. Um, I was hoping to do the proof. It's two lines, but I won't, OK? I mean, so it's a, it is the standard on, on crossing argument. So this means that I have this nice structure as I look at some, here's some fractional solution, and here are the outer bands, if you will, of, of the cuts that are, in this case, one narrow. And so the, the cuts are not disjoint. If you look at it here, let's say, um, that if I look at the edges that cross from here over to the left, this edge is in it, but it's also in this town arrow cut. So what I can do instead is say, for this cut, I'm going to select those edges that start exactly in that outer layer and only in that outer layer. So the ones that are in bold, I'm selecting that. And now as a result, I'm just apportioning those cuts. And uh, so what then can argue is that we actually are getting most of the weight that crosses that cut by making the selection. And then that, and that most is, again, a 1 minus tau. So again, something 1 minus that's order epsilon in terms of how much weight that, that we're, we're saving. And so what that means is that rather than boosting things that the deficiency times, times the incidence quantity, we have to sort of rescale by this 1 over 1 minus epsilon. Kind, kind of thing. But it, so it slightly perturbs the, the overall balancing. But all is said and done, we still end up slightly under 2 thirds. OK? So, so that's we've broken 5 thirds. And indeed, if you add some bells and whistles to the analysis I gave, you got, we originally went down all the way to the golden ratio. Andras Shebu came along and gave a somewhat better analysis and got it down to 1.6. Zhiwan Gao uh, gave a unified analysis, which was really very elegant, that got it, gave, gave a, a unified proof for the two results. So now I want to switch gears, only five minutes beyond where I wanted to do, and go back to the unit weight graphical case. Um, so, and what I wanted, so, so by now, um, for the ST path, Sheba and Vegan actually met the LP. Um, uh, integrality gap with a combinatorial algorithm. And Gao gave a very simple combinatorial algorithm, a uh, simple LP-based algorithm. And I'm able to give you the whole proof in the next five minutes. So really clean and elegant. So, so we need to sort of rethink things a bit because of it's the unit weight uh, graphical case. Uh, What's really happening in thinking about the interplay of t-joins and augmenting a minimum spanning tree is we're taking multiple copies of an edge so as to create an Eulerian graph. And really what the cost metric that we're bounding is just the number of total edges that we get. And because all we care about is being connected and, 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 and being Eulerian, even degree or parity of degree, there's no point in making more than two copies of any given edge because if there are three copies, one would suffice just the same. Um, so, so now we use that to write an LP, which just says the number of copies. And I'll show you in the next slide, but it's a, a standard version, you know, very natural LP. And the way the algorithm works is we solve the LP, and we use this, it's, which is a different framing, but has all the same structural properties that we already talked about in the previous one. So again, I can look at all of the narrow cuts that, that get generated when I solve that LP, the ST cuts that, that uh, um, 
are under two uh, in terms of the total weight, uh, and that they have this nice layered structure. And the algorithm works as follows, that between each layer, we just choose, the cheap, just choose one edge that goes across that from, from layer Li to Li plus one. And within each layer, we just choose a spanning tree. And now we build together a bigger spanning tree. And the claim is that now we actually can go back to the original Woolsey proof and just take the um, LP solution and divide it by two. And that's going to be a feasible fractional t-joint. So there are a number of things that I need to prove that, most importantly, I need to prove that the algorithm makes sense. That they're actually, if I look at um, the support of the LP solution, um, that we actually can get a, a spanning tree in each layer, and that there is an edge that connects between any given layers that, so I can actually construct that, that spanning tree. But in some sense, this is just a, the old algorithm, just a particular choice of which spanning tree that, that we seen so far. So this is the LP, not a big surprise. It's each edge is between 0 and 2. We have um, cut constraints that go across, and that, that we have the partition constraints. OK, so let this be the chain of, of one narrow cuts, and let Li be the incremental layer, um, just as we, we had analogously. And consider the support graph of the LP solution. And the claim is that if I take some number of layers uh, that are consecutive, that if I look at the union of that and look and just in the support graph, that, um, that that's a connected graph. So, so this uh, will do as follows. And, and I'll take one case. It's really the hardest case. So, so here's my whole graph. And here we have some number of layers. And let's take some layer, so S is in here, and T is in here. And let's say we take J and K um, separated a bit. And what I need to do is I need to prove that the graph induced by the LP solution on these layers is connected. Okay. So we have sort of four parts to our graph. Let's say it's not connected. That means there's a cut. So we have, let's call this S0, let's call this S1, let's call this S2, and let's call this S3. Okay. So what do I know? Well, we know that um, S1 and S2 are cuts that don't contain either S or T. Those are my easy LP constraints that say they have at least weight 2 going across that cut. So we have, for each of those, we have weight at least 2. On the other hand, S0 and S3 were defined to be one narrow. So that means they have weight strictly both less than 2. Okay. But now one can think about if I take any edge that leaves, let's say, S1, but symmetrically S2, it must go either to S0 or to S3 because, I mean, we defined them because these were not connected. So that means that the total weight in S1 and S2 is bounded from above by the total weight in S0 plus S3. But S0 plus S3 were less than 4 in total, and S1 plus S2 were at least 4 in total, and one of those inequalities was strict. So we have a contradiction. and. Therefore, it must be connected. Good. So the next thing I need to argue is that I actually get a fractional t-joint where that's the wrong parity of degree. And so suppose there is a violated set um, where it's an odd set. Well, we know it has to be an st cut. It has to be one narrow by definition of narrowness. Um, and now that by the construction, the number of tree edges crossing each narrow cut is exactly one. We just built it that way. But remember our key lemma. The key lemma says take any spanning tree, and the wrong, you know, the, the number of edges crossing any odd cut for any odd set has to be even, or has to be at least two. So none of those could be odd sets. So 
indeed, the only places that I have one, I'm golden. Okay. So, so this is a feasible fractional T joint. Good. So, in fact, this analysis had nothing to do with the unit weight case other than we could construct such a cheap tree. And the goal for all the work that ensued was somehow to take these structural properties and lift those ideas to general metrics. Um, so, I mean, the natural thing would have been to take and say, well, suppose I just you know, took the minimum cost edge across each layer in the narrow cut, thing, and I took a minimum spanning tree. Well, Gauss showed that those can be bad. So that there are examples for which there. But there are there's sort of glimmers of hope. So in some sense, the rescaling algorithm and argument that I showed earlier really showed that for every one narrow cut and for any convex combination of X star and two stars, that, that it, you know, if I look at that one cut, um, there's, a, there's a good fraction of the weight of the trees that, are on, on, that, that have a unique edge in that cut. And somehow what Gao is showing is that this property of having unique edges across these targeted cuts is exactly the key to making progress. And that's what now get called Gao trees that, that, uh, that, that have this additional special property. And so Gottschalk and Vegan showed that there existed a representation now that this, I mean, what we used was for any convex combination. They showed that there's a sp particular convex combination uh, of spanning trees such that if I take any tau, the total weight of trees that have a unique intersection would now with every tau narrow cuts, the, I'm gonna be, so that I'll be able to get feasibility across is at least one minus tau. So there's a good weight that gets, gets, gets put there. And that allows them to rebalance all the rebalancing games and get an improved guarantee. And the, what they get down to by now is 1.566. We're making progress. Um, one side note that their algorithm had to do all kinds of klutzy rounding in order to actually produce this convex combination. I mean, they, 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 it's one thing to show that there exists such a decomposition. Um, in fact, Shala Kamchebu, Trab, and Van Salen recently gave a strongly polynomial matroid based algorithm to, to, to prove, to compute this decomposition nicely. Shebu and Van Salen uh, built upon all of the machinery to date and got down to one half plus um, one over 34, so another 3% improvement. And, and the, the new idea um, was sort of actually the first time, and this is, I mean, always a tension in, in TSP approximation algorithms is we tend to always keep everything we put into the solution and never throw anything away. So Munkit Svensson is the great counterexample to that where progress was made by doing both additions and deletions. Um, and and Sheba and Van Salen do that too. They delete some of these edges that are unique intersections with one narrow cut in a very delicate and careful way uh, so as to uh, make further progress. But I want to spend the last few minutes giving you a hint of, of the progress that came this summer, um, which uh, uh, was due to Trab and, 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 and Vegan, uh, to get down to three halves plus an epsilon. So one thing to realize is that, OK, I'll draw another more or less symmetric, <coughs> identical copy of the same thing. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And let's say that, uh, let's look at what my optimal ST path looks like. Let's just, as, whoops. There, let's go back there, there, there. Whoops, one more, keep going. Well, it works. OK, um, good. I can't count. So, so one thing to observe about, I mean, these are my one narrow cuts. And one thing to observe about any ST path is, of course, that its intersection with every cut is going to be odd. So it's either going to be one or at least three. The ones we sort of know are good. 
that, uh, that, that, that they're, they're the crucial elements for our gout trees. So which cuts are good and which edges span them? So this edge is the unique one spanning this cut. Um, this edge is the unique one spanning that cut. And I actually have two more. Maybe I'm going to get rid of this. <laughs> OK, no, I won't. I'll be good. I won't cheat. Um, so two more. So, so this is the unique edge. Now let me cheat. So there we go. Um, and this is the unique edge spanning. I knew it was going to fall off. Spanning that. So, so these are the lonely edges, and these are cuts that have this unique edge property. And the first element of, of the Traub vegan idea is to say, well, this gives me, if, if someone told me just which were the successive lonely, you know, lonely cuts, then this gives me a decomposition into subproblems. And because this is the ST path, this is really like saying, well, I go from S0 to T0, and I go from, whoops, no, that's not, we go S0 to T0, T0, that's sort of a trivial problem. We go from S1 to T1, and we go from S2 to T2, and again, another trivial problem. Okay, so we have this decomposition into smaller ST path TSPs. But there aren't so many of the kinds of ways this decomposition can be done. If I want to just specify this as sort of being the state of a dynamic program, then really I just have to tell you what are the names of these edges. And there are only n of these cuts. What are the cuts that are in succession? So if I recursively somehow had something good, or I just iteratively had something good for each of those subpieces, I could figure out what's the best piecing together in a standard dynamic programming kind of methodology. So I need to find a, a good solution for each and then build them back up um, together. And in fact, one level of this is, is insufficient, that, that, that they need a constant level of recursions. Um, and in fact, that's how the, where the epsilon comes from, in that, that, that it's really depending on how many levels of recursion. And clearly, given the nature of it being a, a large state space, I can only do a constant number of, 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 of levels of recursion. What's the advantage of getting down to a subproblem? Well, for all of these other cuts, now rather than just knowing that, that, that there's at least one going across, I know that within the subproblem, if I've gotten the specific one, there has to be a weight at least three. And so that gives me a way of strengthening it. And if I think about what I do in rescaling that, that gives me addi additional flexibility that I can use a higher multiplier and, and then rebalance things. Um, and sorry, notice that actually for this LP, we've now omitted the uh, degree. <laughs> Write a different LP or? This is, yeah, this is, this is. So, so they're going to have to resolve. And yes, you're going to have to worry about whether narrow cuts for your new version are the same as the narrow cuts for the higher level. There, there, there's a lot of good German engineering underneath the, the hood. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, that's, uh, um, but, but yeah, that's, uh, um, and when all is said and done, uh, you end up with the ability to get arbitrarily close to 1.5. I guess if I understand correctly the question, does this imply integrality for the original thing? Ah. <laughs> Answer. Right. It does not it imply. And in some sense, it's, it, it, it is a masterwork of German engineering. But, but it's certainly, you know, from my, I now you know, put my opinion flat out there, it's not the right answer. Because I really believe that the integrality gap is three halves. And there should be a solution that just goes at it cleanly and combinatorially without uh, all that. So, so yeah, the Sheba and von Salen. Is the best. So, so I mean, there are a number of higher level issues that I should just blast through. Um, I mean, sampling Christophides gives you all kinds of power. Um, 
One question is, what's the right distribution to sample from? We've seen the Gottschalk and Vegan way. We had the Max Appen entry Entropy way. There was some really elegant computational work that Genova and, and Williamson did that, that really showed that the Max Entropy distribution produces um, random trees that look very different from, from, from what you'd otherwise say, very sort of branchy and, 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 and to the like. I mean, very long strands, um, not very bushy. Um, <coughs> Um, I mean, it's also to sort of meta questions. I mean, this is a domain where randomization um, was natural, and there are lots of domains where randomization is getting used. Um, it would be nice to have good analyses of that. And then, of course, given the, the surprising new result, it would be nice to understand whether this kind of recursive dynamic programming idea would be useful in other settings. But we've come back to where we started, as any good talk on the TSP should. Uh, that uh, uh, we still don't know anything better than Christophides for the TSP. And that clearly is the open question. The one thing that might be different is this sense of that maybe we have the algorithm. Maybe max entropy distribution and random sampling does it for us. We just can't prove it. So maybe there is progress. Let's just prove it. Thank you. Questions? I exhausted you. <laughs> no, I guess that we take questions. I yeah. guess the coffee break. It's time for.